Hello everyone, Team and Gaming, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you another one of my Football Talk videos, the series where I sit down and talk about the goings on in real life football. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the game, because obviously FIFA 15 is still pretty new, so any little bit of droplet of information will be gobbled up by you guys. But this is a season's game. It's actually the first season's game I've played. So the guy I was playing against you know, wasn't the best player of all time. And I ended up absolutely mothering him. But this game followed a very, very similar pattern to pretty much every game I play on FIFA at the moment. I am finding it so much harder to finish chances. I'm creating a silly amount of chances and missing them. And you will see this happen countless times in this game where I will just tear him apart, get a very easy chance or a one-on-one -on -one or a shot from 20 yards and I will just miss and I will miss. I seem to have more luck scoring from 30 yards than I do scoring from 13. It's getting to that stage and you know, it's one of those things, I suppose. I'm still stuck in that FIFA 14 finishing mode when I just run through and whack it into the top corner and it doesn't work. It doesn't work, but I'm still trying to do it for some reason. It's just instinct because I've been playing in that way for so long I just keep pressing that button and holding it down a bit too much and shanking it and it's definitely noticeable in my ultimate team because I've been playing with people like Bonnie and Remy up front who are useful but they don't have that real top class finishing of a very very highly rated striker and this is one of the reasons why I decided to play a bit of seasons and just play as Real Madrid for a bit because all of the guys up front have ludicrous finishing so if I miss a chance I'll know it's because I've done something wrong and this is what I'm doing to slowly hone my finishing get it better because I, I played the game on Ultimate Team and the guy I, I actually tweeted about it the guy had three shots and he scored all of them and I had like 20 and ended up losing 3-2 because I just missed so many chances but that's the reassuring thing. I'm at least battering players. I'm going out there and I'm controlling the game. I'm defending pretty well. And if I took my chances, I'd win every game 8-0. It's, it's getting to that stage. But you know that's what's going on with me playing FIFA. Unfortunately, I have no idea why, but FIFA continually persists to minimise. And all of the things that I've tried haven't worked so far. I've played a little bit today. Played three games, two of them were fine and one of them minimised. But even in this game, the game didn't actually minimise. But what happened about 60 minutes in, and you'll probably see a little bit of a stutter in the footage. What happened was, um, another notification or something popped up. And FIFA tried to you know keep going, but the notifications also tried to overpower FIFA. So what ended up happening was, it didn't minimise, but... The sound went, and I think why was because the notification took priority on my computer, so that caused FIFA not to minimise like it normally did, but to go a little bit further behind. It was really strange, so it was still full screen, but the sound had gone, and obviously I'm playing with an Xbox controller, so then I'd have to reach for the mouse and click on the screen to get it to you know, come to the front again, even though it didn't actually fully minimise that time. So it's just really, really confusing at the moment. So if you guys have any experience with this problem on PC. I've done all of the standard things. I've you know, turned my antivirus into gaming mode. I've gone to the task manager and stopped as many processes as I can without actually stopping the core process of the computer. I've run virus scan after virus scan because that was what originally didn't help. I did actually get a virus on this computer, but I've done several scans. I've gone into save mode and scanned it, and it, it seems to have removed it now. But it's just one really, really frustrating endless slug to try and get this FIFA to work and the good news is I've finally managed to get my capture software going so as long as the game doesn't minimize the capture software is actually recording quite nicely now I managed to sort it out I'm not sure what the problem was but it was doing really really stuttery recording and it seems to be all right touch wood now on that so if I'm going to stop the minimizing then I can finally finally get to record again because it's been really really frustrating been playing as much FIFA as I can and I don't really have a, a huge amount of time to play obviously because I've been working a lot but whenever I get the opportunity to play on FIFA it keeps minimizing so I can't record a lot of the time because when it does minimize it actually stops the recording so I haven't actually been able to sit down and record a live commentary I've attempted it a couple of times and then 40 minutes into the game the game minimizes and it's just it's so frustrating so if you guys have any ideas what you can suggest to me to try and help fix that I would be greatly appreciative but anyway that's enough for me waffling on let's actually talk a little bit about football which would be nice and there's only one place to start and that is England there's a couple of topics I want to cover about England in this video so let's get straight on it and the first one is Wayne Rooney and Wayne Rooney is a, a sort of player who's been 
the topic of conversation on this channel for so long and on so many opportunities and so many examples and the, the conversation normally goes back to the same point Wayne Rooney receives a huge amount of criticism when he plays for England, but the, the fact is he's got 99 caps, he scored over 40 goals, he scored 5 goals in his last 10 internationals, he scored more competitive goals for his country, 30, than any other player in England's history. He's almost certainly, barring catastrophic injury, going to be our all-time record goal scorer. Yet every single, pretty much every single international window, every single time Wayne Rooney pulls on an England shirt, there's... Criticism, and it's fairly endless and repetitive criticism that he doesn't offer enough and he isn't as good as everybody says he is. And I think a lot of this is due to the, the whole English hype. And we always see this with young English players. When there's a young English player comes through, he's not just a good player. He's the next Re Messi. He's the next Bobby Moore. He's the next this. He's the next that. And it always happens. And exactly the same thing happened with Wayne Rooney. He burst onto the scene in Euro 2004. He had a great tournament. Everyone said, wow, this guy's going to be the next best thing since sliced bread. He's going to be absolutely unbelievable. The best player we've ever seen in an England shirt. What a legend he's going to be. And the guy was 80. And when you're already being talked of as the next thing, the best thing in football, the best thing in English football since Bobby Moore, all of a sudden... The pressure's ratcheted up. And even if you have a very good career, because everybody's expectations got so high, it's never going to be enough. And when you look at Wayne Rooney's career as an England player, yeah, he hasn't really turned it on at World Cups. But when you have a look at the World Cups, how many of them has he actually arrived at fit? Not many. I mean, I can remember there was a, a campaign in the, the paper very similar to when David Beckham injured his metatarsal because... Uh, a very, very similar injury happened to Wayne Rooney in the run-up to World Cup. And they had his foot on the front of the papers and you had to touch it and all that rubbish. Uh, that somehow the collective will of loads of people touching a newspaper would help heal him faster. The most ludicrous thing I've heard. But this was the sort of thing. He's always been our talisman. Yet, unfortunately, injuries and unfortunate time lack of fitness and not having enough game time in the run-up to tournaments and then other times the burnout... And this is something I'm going to be running into a little bit later on in this video. But all of this has hindered Wayne Rooney. So even when he's played okay, we're comparing him against the spectre of what we expect him to be. Which is this overinflated image of this legendary footballer. Because when you look at Wayne Rooney's record, there's re it's very, very hard to argue against. He's probably going to be Manchester United's all-time leading goalscorer. He's almost certainly going to be England's all-time leading goalscorer. It's just... I don't know what more we're expecting from him. We're almost expecting him to single-handedly win us tournaments, which is never, ever going to happen. And when you look at that England team, Wayne Rooney isn't the major problem. Wayne Rooney isn't the major problem. We looked incredibly, incredibly lethargic against Estonia, and especially in the first half against San Marino, I thought we were pretty average, to be honest. You know, some stage of the first half against Estonia, we were keeping over 80% of the ball, which in international football is absolutely ludicrous. Spain, in their height, kept 80% of the ball rarely. Even when they were playing fantastically well, you would very, very rarely see that possession indicator hit 80%. However, do you know who the two players with the highest amount of passes were in the England team against Estonia? It was Phil Jagielka and Gary Cahill, our centre-backs. And this is what the problem is. We are far too ponderous in possession. When England look the most dangerous, it's when players like Jack Wilshire and Danny Welbeck and Adam Lallana and Raheem Sterling get the ball in the enemy's half with a bit of space to run at players and move the ball quickly. When we sort of get the ball down, because... This is the thing that really annoys me about international football. It's so, so over-reliant now on this incredible passing style. Because Spain did it. Germany won the World Cup by being ruthlessly clinical. They didn't knock the ball around aimlessly. They got the ball. They had a very solid defence. And as soon as they got it, they looked to move it forward. Not hack it forward, but certainly with an intention of creating a chance. And they were ruthlessly clinical and took their chances incredibly well. Defended very, very well. And ended up winning the World Cup by playing very, very good football that way. So, you know, there's, for, for a number of years now, there's been this style argument. It's just, does English football have a style? Well, 
it doesn't really need the style we're trying to play at the moment, which is this really ponderous passing. And yeah, we're keeping 80% of the ball, but it's Estonia. And to be honest, we didn't create too many clear cut chances in the first half with all of that possession. We had Wayne Rooney's volley. We had the one when the, um, I can't even remember, I think it was Danny Welbeck burst down the left wing and crossed it to Rooney at the near post and he fluffed it. But you know, the volley was a hard chance. Rooney probably should have done better with the initial chance there when the balls come to him on the left hand side. But it's not a lot against Estonia, who are not the greatest footballing side in Europe by any stretch of the imagination. So that's the major problem for me. Is that Wayne Rooney's fault? Is this slow, ponderous style Wayne Rooney's fault? I don't think so. You know, is it Wayne Rooney's fault that Phil Jagielka and Gary Cahill had the vast majority of the ball? No. I don't think it is. I think we're being incredibly unrealistic of what we expect Wayne Rooney to do. You know, he is our best footballer. I don't think there's any debate about that. You know, if you look at his record, if you look at his record at international and club level, if you just look at what he does for the team, you know, he's an incredibly unselfish player. You know, if a lot of players would have been played out of position at the World Cup, they would have kicked off, they would have moaned, they would have grunted, oh, I don't like playing on the wing. Did Rooney moan once? No, he got on with it. And he did a decent job, in my opinion. You know, when you're asking him to play wide left... You're not going to get the best out of Wayne Rooney, but he did a job for the team because Raheem Sterling was our best player at the time. He was in form and his best position at the time was in the centre. And you know, when we played Wayne Rooney on the right against it, on the left, sorry, against Italy, who was our best player on the night? Raheem Sterling playing in the middle of the field. And I mentioned that in another Football Talk video uh, at the time talking about that. So... I don't know what we expect from him. Right? I really, really don't. I think a lot of this criticism is very, very unfair. We just have to face up to the fact that we're not a very good international team. And I've talked about this on several occasions, the reasons why. The lack of coaching, the poor facilities, the lack of young players coming through and getting a chance at the highest level. All of these things. I'm not going to beat that dead donkey anymore. But this is why, you know... We get a couple of very talented footballers in a generation and we put the weight of our nation's expectations on them and say, go and win us a World Cup. And it's just not realistic. It's absolutely not realistic. Anyway, that's enough on Wayne Rooney. Let's talk about another one of England's best players, Raheem Sterling. Now, a story's come out that in the build-up to the Estonia game on the Saturday before the game, Raheem Sterling went to Roy Hodgson and told him that he wasn't really feeling 100% and that it would be a better idea for him and for the team if he didn't start against Estonia. And that's basically what happened. He came on 64 minutes in, had a nice little cameo, actually won the free kick, which Wayne Rooney scored to win England the game, so he definitely had an impact. But there was a bit of a, bit of a brouhaha in the press, as there always is with England, over whether this was the right thing to do. And you've got some people coming out and saying, you know, the guy's 19 years old, it's October, what is he complaining about? He plays two games a week, you know, two games of football a week. I am very unfit, and I would back myself to play two games of football a week. So everybody's saying, what's, th what's the fuss about? What's the fuss? Why is he complaining? And don't forget as well, the thing that's made this a little bit juicier for the press, to be fair to them, is the whole Daniel Sturridge thing. You know, Daniel Sturridge obviously picked up an injury in England at training, everyone said, oh, you know, England didn't follow the the training schedule Liverpool gave to them. And, oh, you know, Liverpool came out and said, Brendan Rodgers said, oh, he's going to be fit for Liverpool, but he's not fit for England. And all of that kicked off and was a bit of a grisly mess, to be, to be brutally honest. So this story has been painted in that light, that Brendan Rodgers has been put a bit of pressure on Raheem Sterling to go to Roy Hodge and say, listen, Raheem, you're not playing. You need to be fit for Liverpool. Personally, I don't think that happened. I think what happened was exactly how Roy Hodgson explained it. Raheem Sterling felt a little jaded and he felt it was in his best interest for himself and the team to not play 90 minutes. And to be honest, I think you've got to go fair play. Rio Ferdinand came out and, and said something very, very smart on Twitter, which is that English players are very often too proud to admit when it would be better for them to have a break. And this is one of the other really major problems with the English league and the English league system, is that it doesn't have a winter break. And when you have a look at the all the other major leagues in Europe, they have a winter break. So automatically, all of their players have an extra month and a half off compared to the English players. Because if you have a look, how many English players actually play outside of England? 
the answer is basically none. You've got Ashley Cole, but he's retired and he's played in England for the vast majority of his career. You always get a, a few go off to poodle around in America for a little bit at the end of their careers. But apart from that, not many. You've got like Michael Richards is, is away on loan, but that, that's it. There's not a vast array of players who do that. So automatically, that puts English players behind in terms of how much football they play in a row. Raheem Sterling was a key figure for Liverpool for the entirety of last season. He was basically a first-team regular for the entire season. No winter break, no rest. Then he went to the World Cup and was a key player for England and had no break and no rest. And then he's come back, had basically no pre-season, and he's been asked to try and replace Luis Suarez. So he's gone into a Liverpool team and he's now all of a sudden known as one of the key players and one of the best potentials and the media's gone mad oh he's going to be incredible he's going to be the next this la 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 he's going to be ronaldo all of that's been put on him if you're asking a 19 year old to play as a key player for his country and liverpool in the premier league race for pretty much 14 months and then go to a world cup and not have a break i don't think it's unreasonable that after all that time he thinks do you know what it's only Estonia. Adam Lallana played really well in the second half against San Marino. Let's let's start Adam Lallana. Let's give Raheem Sterling a bit of a break. Let's not grind his nose into the dirt so that when he actually does get to a major tournament, he can be useful. It's just... Uh, English football really does frustrate me sometimes because as a nation, we have a massive tendency just to shoot ourselves in the face repeatedly. We have all of these high expectations, but we aren't realistic as to how to achieve them. We think just by writing patriotic news articles and being really vitriolic and brash, that's going to change things. And it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You know, Our league system probably needs reorganising. We need a lot more coaches, we need winter breaks, we need all of these things, then we might be competitive internationally. When we mirror how the Germans are successful and how the Spanish were successful and all of these nations, when we actually take a little bit of a hint from the way they do things, then we might actually start winning international football matches a little bit better. To absolutely hammer Raheem Sterling because he's been pretty much playing non-stop for 14 months with the spotlight of the entire country on him, I think that's a little bit harsh. And yeah, you can say he's 19 or whatever, but he's in a high pressure environment. He's asked to do a lot. He is the focal point, the talisman of an international side age 19. And what's that really saying for our international team when we are basically relying on youngsters like Raheem Sterling to carry us to victory all the time. It's a little bit of a sad indictment, unfortunately. But anyway, guys, that's the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, there's been a lot to talk about England this week again, and England seems to be the main focus of my channel for football talk. It really does. But that's because there's just so much to talk about. There really, really is. And with the media the way it is in this country, where every little nugget is blown into the sky, there was a, a really good example, actually, of Louis van Gaal at the World Cup when he was managing the Dutch team, Rio Ferdinand was obviously a pundit at the World Cup and he went into a, into a bar and he was just sitting there talking to some of his friends and all of a sudden the entire Dutch team walked in and Rio Ferdinand was sitting there going, oh, is Louis all right with this? And you know, he was asking Schneider and all those guys and they came back to him and said, yeah, it's fine, van Gaal doesn't mind, as long as we're back in the hotel by 11, he's completely fine with it. And this is the thing, if that was the England team who'd all gone into a bar during the World Cup, that would have been front and back page news, there would have been exposés, Martin Samuels would have slated them, and you know, this is what doesn't help, all of this nonsense, absolute nonsense. We need to stop absolutely shredding our own national team to smithereens at every opportunity, because it's to the complete detriment of the players and the performance, and all of this mental anguish and strain and pressure. Yeah, you can say, you know, it's only playing football at the end of the day. But when you are in, your, in an international sportsman and you read the papers and it's just endless column up inch after column inch of noise, which is basically what the, the vast majority of it is, it will take its toll. And you know, I am a little tired of us shooting ourselves in the face, like I've mentioned. But anyway, guys, thank you so, so much for watching the video. As always, I'll be delighted to read all of your comments if you have any opinions on what i've said i'll be really interested to hear what they are but once again thank you so so much for watching and as always have a great day